Hey, ambitious dentist, welcome to Start Your Dental Practice, the show for existing and aspiring dentists to take your dental practice to the highest possible level. I'm your host, Jonathan Van Horn, CPA and ABV, founder of DentistMetrics.com. In every episode, we aim to demystify the how to start a dental practice problem by bringing on world-class dentists, influencers, and consultants in the dental industry to pick their brain about how to get past the barriers involved from going from no practice to being a practice owner to owning your own successful dental practice. Today's show features Jeff Gladnick. You'll learn more about him in just a second. First, here are a few things you're going to hear about today. We're going to talk about how Jeff initially got started making websites and how he started automating the process to help out more dentists. You're going to learn about the referral conversation your ideal patients inevitably have, how your website can negatively or positively affect how many of those ideal patients show up to your practice, why your social media channels should match your website, and the psychological triggers that fire when they do. We're going to answer the question, which should come first, opening your practice or getting your website up, as well as what time frame you need to be following. It's really important information. We're going to talk about how Google will treat your site in the first 90 days and why this is important to launching your site and new practice. We're going to talk about how getting your site ranked number one in Google without hacking the search engine. How to avoid having your practice mislisted in the wrong city or state, which could have huge implications on how many people actually know how to get to your practice. We're going to talk about why you shouldn't rely on a one-person operation and what could happen to your site if you do, what happens when you don't use the terms your ideal patient uses to describe your services, what you need to know to avoid losing your site and content forever, the red flags you need to look for when trying to find a website development firm, the cons to having contracts involved with getting your website set up. We're going to talk about how to handle a website when you're acquiring a previously established practice, how to avoid losing SEO juice when transferring a website from one owner to another. We're going to learn about the one vital thing every acquired practice needs to have so that your visitors don't experience site errors. We're going to look at how to avoid looking like every other website in your market. Critical. You're going to learn what duplicate content is and why you need to be avoiding it. And finally, we're going to learn a really important lesson in today's day and age, and that's the right and wrong way to make sure your site appears properly on mobile devices. So at the end of this episode, Jeff has created an amazing resource that's going to walk through everything we talked about in this interview, as well as a lot more. And it's going to be a step-by-step guide to how to create a website step-by-step so that if you are just determined to do this yourself, you're going to be able to do it. So be sure to listen to the end to be able to find how to get that amazing bonus from Jeff. So now on to today's guest interview with Jeff Gladnick. Hello, ambitious dentist. This is Jonathan Van Horn, founder of DentistMetrics.com. Today I have with me Jeff Gladnick, the founder of Great Dental Websites. The goal of these interview series is to give more information, give more tools to be able to put into the pockets of dentists who are close to becoming owners, who are considering becoming an owner and just want to prepare themselves for the 3.4 billion different things that they have to know as a business owner. So one of those areas that has a lot of mystery to it that people get confused on a lot of the times is what the heck to do with their website. So I could think of nobody else better to come on to talk to us about that than Jeff from Great Dental Website. So a little bit about Jeff. Uh, he has a really great dental story that I'm actually going to let him share because I think he could probably tell it a lot better than I can. Um, but he really gives a lot back to the dental industry. If you ever go on to Dental Town or uh, any type of forum like that, he is usually one of the first people to respond with exactly what people need. And one of the reasons I really, really like Jeff is he's one of the few people that sell websites that will tell you what you don't need. Uh, I find it's very, very rare in this industry to find people that are willing to uh, to tell you what you actually need versus trying to sell you every single service that their company has. So with that, Jeff, was that was that a good introduction for you? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think the story you're alluding to is my uh, family's background. 
<laughs> yes, yes. Well, I think you have a great you have a great uh, professional background too if to, to 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 service the industry. But let's talk with your let's talk with your your story about your dad. Uh, yeah, my uh, so I'm a electrical engineer by training. Um, that was what I went to school for, and I was I was really bad at designing circuits and microprocessors. So I got into software, uh, which I was very good at. And I like every other software engineer. I followed the dream and moved out to San Francisco to work at a startup. And my dad had uh, called me, I guess, when I was, you know, in 60 hour weeks um, and wanted me to redo his website that I made for him when I was in like, like a freshman in college or something. It was like six years later. And I didn't have any time. So I told him to go get some bids. They were absurdly expensive. I could not believe how much people, it, the prices we were charging uh, to build applications that actually did stuff and interacted with databases and web services were like half the price that dentists were being charged for a simple five page website with just plain text. I couldn't believe it. Um, so I told him I would just make him one himself. And I learned how to make um, programs that could serve multiple customers using the same code. So basically you divide the cost of the uh, code amongst X number of customers. You can save some money like that. And it makes it a lot easier to maintain it. So I, I decided I would try this out for my dad and one of my uncles who got wind of this project. There, there's seven dentists in my family, and then the rest of them heard about this. So we had our first group of beta users. And I think I was about halfway through development of the software when uh, they started referring their friends. And it, that was the first time it occurred to me that this could be a business instead of just a favor for some of my family members. And the, the company kind of limped along like that for two or three years. I slowly started posting on Dental Town, but my day job is still a software engineer working now for another startup. And I, I think there's one engineering meeting that I was in at work one day, and my phone rang like three or four times with different people calling to talk to me about dental websites during the meeting, and I couldn't take the call. Um, but it, I was kind of wondering at that point, maybe I could really make a go of this. Uh, and I, I think the, the revenue from the company was like half my salary and I had a little savings. So I decided to take a chance, I quit my job, uh, moved my family to Colorado within a month. And um, that's kind of where we've been ever since. That was about five years ago. That's great. So, so you went from, from a, 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 a cushy, stressful uh, startup job to, to risking it all to go out and uh, move. Were you, was that home? Was 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 Colorado home before? No, uh, home was Delaware. Um, I also, at, at the time, I, I didn't feel like I was risking at all. I had taken like a side project doing some consulting um, for another startup um, that uh, needed some software development expertise. So I, at that point, it would have been really easy to just go back uh, to being a full time software engineer. I haven't done software engineering now for a few years, so I still remember it and I still talk to, you know, the engineering team at Great Dental Websites, but they cut me out of the code base, I think like six months ago, uh, when, when we switched uh, the program we used to keep track of the code. Mm -hmm. And they're like, they basically said, just, just let us know if you need an account to, to check code in and to submit code. And I still haven't asked them for one. And I, I think they did that deliberately. I think I was slowing things down. You were the bottleneck at that point. Well, yeah. Yeah. That happens. So what we're talking about today, like here in the intro, we're trying to introduce people to, you know, the, the, the reason what what role in a dental practice the website plays. Because even back like I run on your, your website that was nineteen ninety nine when your dad decided, you know, he needed to go on to the internet. Um, even back then compared to today, that was sixteen years ago. I would I would argue that the website is a much more integral part of a dental practices ecosystem. I guess for for the majority of for the majority of locations in, in in America, what is that role for a website in a practice? Um, I mean, you mean like how it's changed over the years, or or what is the role uh, of a website? You know, how, or how should a practice use their website? Uh, right now, what is what, how should a practice use a website? Oh, I mean, it, besides the obvious of online marketing um, and acquiring new patients who are just kind of searching in their local area for a dentist online, mm -hmm. um, I think it can be tremendously useful for referrals. Um, we see this all because uh, a lot of dentists uh, tell me, well, I get all my 
patients for referrals. I have a healthy referral uh, base, and I, I just keep getting new patients for referrals. Well, a great website can help with that. Um, typically, referrals don't just happen in a vacuum where you know you and I are having lunch, and I say, "Oh, you should go see you know my dad, Dr. Gladnick," and you say, "Great!" You pick up the phone and you schedule an appointment. That's rare. Um, most of the time, uh, we'll start to people will ask more than one person. Or they'll ask their friends online in social media, like on Facebook or on nextdoor.com or meet, a meetup group. Um, and I see this on a monthly basis. My wife is in, I think she's in like 10 or 11 um, moms groups in, around Denver for various interests or localities. And almost every month, invariably, somebody new comes to the city and the first couple of questions they ask are, you know, where do you guys uh, take your kids for fun? You know, who's your pediatrician? And of course, who is your dentist? And that usually represents, you know, four, five, sometimes six new patients uh, because you're getting an entire family. And every single time that happens, um, four or five, you know, sometimes 20 people will apply and say, go to my dentist. Here's his name. Here's his website. Um, so you have to kind of get past that first level of research. And that's where having a great website and having a great online presence um, can really make a difference because they're going to look at a couple different dentists and you want to make a good impression and you want everything to be consistent. So if they talked about you on Facebook and that's the first place they find you, your website should look a little similar to your Facebook page. It should have the same kind of content, the same kind of vibe for the content you're posting. So being consistent through social channels as well as through, uh, through, through, uh, the, the website is an important factor to, to be considering that. Yeah, it, it comes down to online branding. And this is why Fortune 500 companies spend a lot of time and money um, and detail and attention to detail on this. Um, you're looking at, if you're looking at a bunch of different dentists and you're looking at a couple different places on review sites, um, people commonly check review sites um, on social media and on the website, you want them to mentally link those experiences and hopefully they're, they're all positive. Uh, to your brand. So if they're on your Google Plus page looking at your reviews, they, you should see your logo on there. It should have a similar you know, color scheme or design to your website. Same thing on Yelp and Facebook where it's possible. Um, so all the great things they've read about you get mentally connected in their mind um, you know, when, they, when they finally make a decision and you stand out. Okay. So as far as speaking to our audience of someone who is uh, going to be starting a practice. Let's let's take for example someone who's going to do a startup practice. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot, a lot of this. Yeah, so it seems to me that like there's a lot of confusion to certain uh, to what time they need to actually launch that website because some people I've t I spoke with and they said, mm -hmm. yeah, we waited until four months after we got open because we were so busy that that was the last thing that was on our mind. Some people said that was one of the first things they wanted to do because they wanted to start promoting it through the website. So what, 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 what do you see as being the, the norm? So I, ideally about uh, 90 days out before you launch, um, you still will get a trickle of uh, new patients who are trying to schedule an appointment. Um, and sometimes they can be accommodated later um, if they don't need an appointment right away. Um, you can still uh, kind of, and, and the other thing is it gets the ball rolling if you're going to be doing search engine optimization. If you're not planning on doing search engine optimization ever, if you're in a really rural area and you're the dentist, uh, maybe it's not that big of a deal. But if you're in even a suburban uh, market where it's a little bit more competitive, I think the last time I checked, Google was putting brand new domains into like a 90 day sandbox where they basically treated you as a new entrant. They're like, well, we don't really trust you yet. You just got here. And even if you get all the tuning right on the website to make a website rank highly on Google, it usually takes about 90 days for, you know, for it to get a little bit of traction and get out of that kind of penalty box. Additionally, if you're doing SEO, there's a lot of like verifications and um, submissions to directories and building what we call online citations um, that takes time. So if you want your website to be ranking uh, at least you know, fairly well by the time you launch, and really those projects take, instead of 90 days, more like three to six months, um, the sooner you start, the better. You're obviously going to be incurring some expenses for uh, online marketing before you start if you go that route. But if you want to hit the ground running, that's what you should do. 
can also just kind of launch the site 90 days out and let things limp along. You'll still be better off than if you launched it on the day you opened or four months after. I've got to say that I've visited new practices plenty of times. And the, the first thing that I do whenever I'm going to a new practice is I'll, if I don't know where it is, I'll get my phone out and I'll try and find the location and it'll just drive me bonkers if they have actual absolutely no presence on the internet. So kind of speaking back to what you were going to, to peel that back a little bit uh, for anyone who doesn't know, SEO is how Google ranks your website. So if someone searches your name, or your, even something as specifically as your name or something more vague like your city than dentist, SEO is search engine optimization to where the you're more likely to be ranked as one of the first results if you have really good SEO. Um, so that, that's a great point about the sandbox. That's something I don't hear a whole lot of people talking about. And one more follow point on this. Um, a lot of times with a startup, um, the dentist was previously an associate in another city or another state. And we have a new uh, a new client we just gave a proposal to a week ago who's in this situation. Um, and she's a dentist in a, a suburb of Denver. And her name comes up in another part of Denver and in another state if you Google her by name. So that, and she just bought a practice in a suburb. So that can be a little confusing if somebody's trying to refer you and they're driving to the other side of town um, and doing it blindly and that can happen. Um, so if you're, concerned about this, you can always just Google your name and see what comes up. If nothing's coming up, it'll be easier to get the right one to appear. Um, if the wrong place is coming up, that's a little bit trickier and you might want to talk to your uh, web development or marketing company a little bit ahead of time. Good information. So if they're trying to be launching at 90 days out, at what point would they need to start talking with a web company to, to get the ball rolling to be started? Uh, well, it depends on the dentist. Um, some dentists take, uh, are very cautious and take a lot of time to make a decision. Um, some dentists make a decision within days uh, when we speak to them. But you should probably, uh, it usually takes us about two months to launch a project if the client is motivated and has time to dedicate to the process. Uh, we like to do everything custom, um, and that's what you should be buying, uh, regardless of what company you go with. So it's going to take a little bit of time to write the content, to make a graphic design that you like. If you're doing a logo, add a couple week, like a week or two for that. Um, because there's a little bit of back and forth. We can't read your mind. Um, so we have to give you samples and then adapt and adapt and adapt. Uh, so I would ask the comp whatever company you're looking at, um, it, you should start that process early. You don't have to buy it yet. You just have to kind of decide on who you're going to work with and ask them how long they would advise you to take. And we usually tell people at least two months, um, but some dentists take longer if they're busy. Uh, we have one dentist that took, I mean, over a year who went on two safaris to Africa um, during the process. I always like to tell that story. Uh, he went on a safari, came back, was slammed and told us, you know, don't, don't talk to me for a month. I'm, I'm just recovering here. And then after that, he went back to Africa uh, for another safari. And then the same thing happened. So that, that can delay a project and that's fine. Um, I don't want to stop people from seeing lions, but uh, you know uh, you have to budget your time accordingly to yourself and whatever guidance you get from your, your marketing company. And then on top of that, there's also the the finding the, the the time frame of actually finding the right company to work with you. So whenever someone's looking for someone to start this process, so at this point we you need to launch 90 days beforehand, so three months. It, you should look at probably around two months for development. And so you're going to have, you know, a time frame before that where you're weeding out the people that you do or do not want to work with. So around, so I, you know, I, probably a fair assessment if you are someone that's doing a, a brand new startup would be at least six months beforehand whenever you need to start calling up these development companies. Uh, and so, yeah, that, that's ideal. I mean, if there are some shortcuts you can do, we can launch like we will launch temp sites for people if they have nothing um, right out of the gate. So that can usually be done within like three days. So that can shave two months off you know, the sandbox clock. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's ideally uh, six months out is when you should start making the calls. Interesting. So uh, whenever you're talking to these companies that are potentially going to be you know, working with and developing a relationship with. And 
like we talked about earlier, the, 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 the part, the role of a website now is very, very important for a lot of practices. Uh, so this isn't typically going to be a one and done situation. You're going to have a longer relationship, at least in my mind, in today's day and age, ideally that's what would be going on is you'd have a long-term relationship with this, with, with this type of company. Is that what you see as well? Um, yeah, I mean, some usually, uh, your most dentists don't have the uh, technical capacity or the time to deal with hosting their site, um, applying updates to the software, dealing with backups and FTP clients and MySQL databases. That's just, it, it's not worth their time. So you're going to have to have somebody uh, who's willing to do that. And some, uh, I mean, a lot of uh, dentists will hire a local guy and that's totally fine. Um, I prefer they would hire a local company uh, or some kind of company because a local guy um, can get a full-time job um, and just kind of leave you in the lurch. We see that a bit. So, you know, as you're narrowing down what type of company to work with, um, you, it shouldn't be just one person. One per something can happen to one person. We had a, a competitor um, where they went offline for a while and everybody started posting in dental town, like, what happened to this guy? He unfortunately had passed away. Um, people die um, eventually, uh, and or people get full-time jobs, people move, people just decide they don't want to do it anymore. Companies that have been around for a while are a little bit more resilient. Um, one person can leave, and it's not going to affect the operations. Um, I could, you know, if, if something happened to me where I was, you know, uh, in a hospital for six months, it really wouldn't affect our customers at this point. Um, we have 27 people that are working on that. So I would try to find a company that's been around for a while that has enough, uh, you know, employees and uh, is, has a big enough customer base that they're, they're not in danger of going under. Um, you, on the other side of the coin, you may not want to work with a company that's huge unless they have, you know, a great value proposition that meets your needs. Um, you want somebody that has experience with dental. There's a lot of you know, headaches and, and uh, hard lessons we've learned in the first couple of years in this company. Um, like what, one example is that you, know, you should never call bleaching uh, bleaching on your website. You should call it teeth whitening. That's what consumers believe it's called. Um, you shouldn't even call it tooth whitening. That has one eighth the search volume of teeth whitening. Bleaching has one twentieth the search volume of teeth whitening. So there's a lot of things like that that um, a company that's worked with a lot of dentists has probably figured out, and a company that hasn't won't. Um, and then there's a couple other questions you want to know. I mean, what's going to happen if you break up, if there's a divorce? Um, how are you going to get your website or your content out of there? What's that going to look like? What's the process? Um, what have they done in the past? We have, uh, this, is, this probably happens once a month. Um, we will get a new customer that is coming from a different company. And the company will behave like a child and shut off their website or try to hold their domain uh, or just be totally uncooperative. And it ends up causing like a minor panic for a couple of days for the customer. And we usually have to go in and bail them out. Um, that happened last week um, where I, I won't name the company, but they're, they're, they have a, a better reputation than they should. And they, the client forgot to pay them like a $30, like some kind of like minor maintenance charge and they just shut everything off. And so their sites were down, their email was down and we had to just kind of put in like a catch all email and send it to the doctor's personal email addresses. So at least patient communications would get somewhere. Um, but you want to make sure that they're not going to engage in that kind of petty behavior if you decide to leave. And more importantly, who is going to own your domain name? If the company registers your domain name for, uh, for you, you need in writing or an email that that's your property. Um, or just insist on you know, registering the domain name yourself um, and then giving the company access to it so they can set things up and then changing the password if you're concerned. Um, it's a little bit more of a hassle for the web development company, but we don't really mind doing it. It only takes another minute. Um, so those are kind of you know, the, uh, a couple things to look for. And, most importantly, get references. Um, I, again, I won't, uh, I'm thinking of a few companies uh, that do this, but there are companies in this industry that are kind of borderline criminal. And, you know, they're, they're, I, we have competitors that I think do a fairly good job. Um, and there, then there are other companies that are basically set up to steal your money. And they just keep charging your card. If you 
you know, change the car, they'll threaten you with lawsuits and collections. It, you just don't want to work with these people at all, at all, ever. Um, you see, Dental Town's a great resource to ask for references um, and ask your colleagues and, or people whose websites you like um, as you do your own research who made it and how they feel about it. But you should be talking to at least you know, two or three customers and the company should have no problem providing you with references. And even if they give you, and ask for like 10 or 20. If the company can't give you, a, and then call two or three random. If the company is uncomfortable giving you references, that's, that's a bit of a red flag. There's not really any secrecy around dental marketing. Um, you know, our, our name's on the bottom of every client's site anyway. <laughs> so it's, there, there, there shouldn't be any issues with that. Yeah, uh, I think you can actually, a lot of times you can actually Google uh, like URL or I don't remember the tag, but if you, there's a hack out there where you can actually Google the, the, the footer tags for certain websites. You can just pull up every uh, a, a website done by a development company. So uh, Yeah, you, you can do that. There are some tools you can use to kind of sniff out um, where what servers the web traffic is pointing to and you can kind of go backwards that way too. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, we, we probably could geek out on some more advanced strategies, but we'll, uh, I'll try to avoid we'll, 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 we'll keep it. We'll try to keep it simple for this thing right now for this interview. Um, so, uh, you know, should you be wary of like any promises from the sales teams and these things? Because a lot of the, you know, like I said, there are nefarious companies out there. It's, I've never seen it in another industry. You know, before I was a dental specific CPA, I was in every type of business, and I've never seen as many of what you just described businesses that operate in that that line uh, as there are in the dental industry. There's so many people that lock people up in contracts and there's a lot of people that promise solutions that are not going to be fulfilled, even though they're, you know, they'll say things like, yes, we can guarantee you that, you know, you're going to get, we're going to spend this much money a month on SEO, this much money a month on, on pay-per-click. You're going to get all these all these leads, and we have a higher conversion rate than you know anyone else. Conversion rate for anyone listening is uh, the, the the if someone comes to your website, they actually like pick up the phone and call you, or they actually come and become a patient. Mm -hmm. um, so, is there any way to like check those types of claims? I guess. Well, usually those types of claims are impossible to verify, and that's kind of why the companies make them. But I can tell you what the red flags are. Um, any company that claims they have any kind of special relationship with Google should run the other way. Google is not going to jeopardize their reputation to cut some kind of inside backdoor deal with a dental SEO company. Um, this is a, you know, a multi hundred billion dollar company. Um, they're not really talking to companies this small. Um, anybody who says they have some kind of patented method for, you know, improving your rankings. I saw that once. Um, that's another red flag. Um, it, but the, the most common is they, they have some kind of deal set up with Google. And usually that's someone who signed up for the Google AdWords partner program, which is a very low bar to get into. I think we were a partner. It took like two hours and a phone call um, and, you know, having a certain level of spending. That, that's it. Um, that doesn't affect our ability to do SEO at all, uh, positively or negatively. Google does not care. They separate those products. So be careful of people saying they're a Google partner and that is going to affect your marketing. They're basically getting some coupons um, to give you a little bit cheaper uh, paid search rates. We get the same thing and just, you know, it's like hundred dollars free when you bring on a new client. So nice, nice bonus. Um, and, any, and people who are making guarantees about search engine optimization results. I, I guess in theory, um, you could guarantee a result and then give you the money back if they didn't have it. Um, but you certainly cannot guarantee that it will happen because Google is a third party that you can't control. I can't, you know, uh, guarantee that I could make you, Jonathan, do something because you're a sentient being that I, I, I don't have any control of. I can make you sign something, but you could still break the contract, and I, I can't guarantee that result. Um, so, uh, and then as what you said with contracts, contracts aren't necessarily bad but they should be a red flag and should kind of start to question why there's a contract in the first place. I can understand why it would make sense to have a contract if, you know, for example, you're financing a lot of marketing work that requires an expensive outlay up front. Um, if we're doing a lot of web development and marketing right out of the gate for a dentist, sometimes we'll finance it. 
-hmm. We don't have contracts because we haven't really had problems with people not paying us. Um, but I could understand why if a company was, you know, incurring, say, I don't know, five or ten thousand dollars worth of expenses, and you wanted to finance that over a year, they may require a contract. But if there's not really a lot of, you know, money up front, and they just want to protect their revenue stream, um, if it's just like a software type of play for, you know, some a company that does, you know, review collection or something, they, they're just flicking a switch here and doing a little bit of configuration. Um, there's not really a reason to have a contract. Um, you should ask why. why. Why is there a contract? Um, we, we don't like to have contracts, and it's, it's basically a response to the market. Um, most of the dentists that we talked to, at least in the beginning, and all, always on Dental Town, just hated the idea of a contract, so we just never did it. The reason we don't use it in our company is because I don't want to sign a contract with anyone else that ties me into their company, so why should I make people do it with mine is, is what is how we've always had our mentality. So yeah, yeah. I, I personally feel that way too. I, I, every time there's a contract, I'm like, ah, oh, got to get the lawyer, got to read this thing. It's all, and it's written in legalese and it's five pages long and there's all kinds of threats and fine print and other States that I'm going to have to sue in. And I, I just don't want, want that experience. Yeah. There's a, if anyone thinks that boss, if the, Another thing I want to add to this, if anyone ever says to you, yes, it's a contract we have, it's a, you know, an agreement that we, our, our lawyers make it, make you fill out in order for us to be able to do this, just everybody just signs it and goes on with it. Do not take that person's word for it. Uh, yeah, lawyers don't make you do anything unless they're uh, majority shareholders. Uh, lawyers advise and you get to do what you want. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, okay, uh, let, let's keep moving down the line. So if, let, let's switch it from a person starting a dental practice to a person that's going to be taking over uh, and acquiring a new dental practice. Mm -hmm. If they already have a website up there and it's one of these that's written by like, a, um, a, a, I can't remember any of the older ones, the, the current ones, there's a bunch of website builders out there that you can go on and pay a hundred bucks for and you automatically have this website then and in theory looks you know it's it's got clean lines and it's got you can put high quality photos in there but there's not a whole lot of functionality that goes with it um if you're buying out of practice we've found that typically what goes on is you're buying something from a company like uh um what, what like televox is, 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 a, is a popular one i think mm -hmm. that they come in mm -hmm. and uh they, they look like they're made in the 1990s most of the time mm -hmm. <laughs> um is what do you recommend people that are going to buy, I'm not saying that specifically about Telebox. I'm, I'm just saying that was a, a name that came up in my <laughs> Rolodex of website companies that I've seen out there. Telebox is fine company. Yeah. So, uh, but the, um, what would you tell someone as far as whenever they're trying to buy out that, when they bought out that practice, they're kind of in that transition period. When's a good time to start looking at, Hey, we need to change this website up. Um, I mean, so there's a couple options if you're buying a new site. Um, if you like the site and you're happy with it and it's performing well online and everything's great, um, you're still going to have to contact the company because there is a significant amount of SEO work that needs to be done if, the, if a couple things are happening. If you're changing locations um, or if you're changing the name of the practice. Usually people keep the phone number. That's the third rail. But if you're changing the name of the practice, there's a lot of online directories, social media profiles, review sites where someone is going to have to go into every single one of them and manually change the name. And this is very important for kind of how Google, Google's local search algorithm works. And they, they use what's called the NAP, um, the name, address, and phone number, to figure out who you are and where all these other properties are online that are related to you. So if they don't match, they think it's a different practice. So you want to kind of not only buy the practice, but their online reputation if it's a good one. Um, if it's not, there's other, well, we can talk about that. But assuming the practice has a good online reputation, you want to acquire those properties as well. So you have to tell the web company what's going on, preferably in advance, so they can make, um, you know, and allocate some resources to do this. Um, if you do all this correctly, you won't lose any placement, you won't lose any traffic, everything will get carried over. Um, if you don't, um, Google will treat you as kind of a brand new practice that doesn't have a reputation. 
And it's easy to think about if you think about like, you know, the edge cases, like there's a dentist in New York City named Joe Smith that's in a skyscraper. There may be two other Joe Smiths who are dentists in that building. And if, you know, a new dentist comes in named, you know, again, named Joe Smith, um, or if somebody buys out the practice, and the name, and it may be the same practice, but now there's, you know, a, a new name coming in. They're going to think it's a new guy. Um, you, you have to have all those things very consistent, and it's a pain in the neck, but somebody's got to do it. Um, as far as the website's concerned, usually when somebody buys a practice, they, they relaunch the website or make a new website. Um, the vital thing that you have to do, and just, just write this down um, and mention it to the web development company, and they should have an appropriate reaction and not be like, what is this? Um, but you should tell them, we need to 301 redirect all the links on the website. And they should say, of course, of course we do that. Um, what that means is every single, the old page for teeth whitening will be, that you'll tell search engines like Google or web browsers, this is the old page for teeth whitening, but we relaunched the website and now the new page is over here. And usually it has a new you know, URL or something. And you have to do that for every single page. If you don't do that, it'll start to display errors to the browser, and it'll say, we can't find this page. And if people find that after clicking a Google link, they're just going to press back, and they're going to go to the next dentist. Um, and Google will see the same thing. They'll see an error, and they'll say, oh, his teeth waiting page doesn't exist. And their entire history and where they rank that page is gone. And if you don't do this, we always see this. You know, the traffic just dips um, when you, they relaunch the site. And eventually it recovers, but in the meantime, you have this, you know, inverted triangle of traffic um, that could have been patients that's gone. Um, you don't want that. So just just say 301 redirect, and the uh, the company should should tell you something like that. Yes, if they if, if they don't know what you're talking about, then uh, th then that should be a giant red flag. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So we moved from there. Um, Whenever the people are vetting, you talked about doing the references and, and talking to colleagues and everything like that. Is there any questions that the company should be asking the dentist that can be used as like a kind of a precursor of, is this a good person to be starting this relationship with? That the company that we should ask the dentist? Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, we usually uh, want to make sure there's a little bit of buy-in uh, from the practice. And it doesn't have to be the dentist, but we require our clients to do a little bit of work. Um, we want them to take before and after cases. We want them to take, um, you know, patient testimonial videos or videos of themselves. We want their front desk to implement some kind of review, patient review strategy to get reviews online or be working with another company that specializes in that. Um, if we have a client that's like, I, I don't want to be involved with this at all, and nobody in my office has time, just tell me where to send the check. That's a bit of a red flag that this client's not going to have a good experience. We still have we have clients that have promised to do what we like and ended up not. And some of them have still been successful, but the only time we've really failed, and these are the you know the the, the projects that keep me up at night or I think about in the shower, but they they never really engaged with us. They didn't do any of their homework. Um, they didn't create any of the content to make themselves unique. Um, some of them, you know, never fill, filled out forms and just told us to write the content. Well, we can't really write about you if we don't know anything about you. Um, so somebody has to do a little bit of work, and usually it's it's like a half hour to an hour a month of work by the practice. You can do a little more, but that's usually the minimum we're looking for. And it, it, zero of that can be done by the dentist, but there ha that's the most important thing. There has to be some kind of, you know, verbal commitment by the practice or the practice owner that yes, we're going to do the vital things that are going to be required for us to be successful online. We want to hear that. Absolutely. I think that's really important to, to stress and, and I'll, I'll reemphasize, you know, if, if you're, you're marketing, you, you don't just have your web marketing and then you have your, you know, your, your direct mail marketing and then all these other things, it's all cohesive. You've got to, you got to make sure that, the right arm is talking to the left arm in a lot of these situations. So that's a really good point that I've, I've never really thought about in, as far as making sure that the provider understands that. I mean, we all, we all want turnkey solutions, but in the end, there's very little in the world that you're going to get more out of what you put into something. Yeah. 
it does, and you can, and you're right about the other marketing playing into it. And every anybody who's doing any kind of offline marketing, uh, we usually hook them up with tracking phone numbers if they don't already have one, and a tracking domain. So when somebody types in, you know, the direct mail piece, because most people, just like the referrals, aren't just going to pick up the phone and call. They're going to keep doing research. If they type in your website address, we want to be able to track that. So if they fill out the contact form or call the number um, from the website, we all want it to be kind of attributed to the same source. And even no matter what kind of marketing you're doing, um, people will probably look you up online after they see it. And you want to have a good presence. And that's where the video and the, the uh, photo content and examples of your work and you know, well-written custom copywriting um, about you can make the difference and convert the patient. Instead of the experience of what you described earlier, when you see a website that looks like it was made in the late 90s or if we're being charitable with the early 2000s, that's not going to be a great experience, especially if it looks like, you know, a thousand other dental websites out there. And some of those may be in your town. Um, we had one client, um, I won't say where, but there were, there, it was an oral surgeon, and there were three oral surgeons in their town, and every single one of them had the exact same website. Exactly. Just the names were changed, the content was identical. Um, so if you refer to one of these, like what, one of these guys, and then you're like, okay, well, I heard about some, somebody else, what does he have to say? about you know, um, wisdom teeth extraction. The exact same thing. Um, that's, that's not impressive to a patient. You want to stand out. You want to be different. You need video. You need content uh, to do that. Right. So you touched on a really important point. So duplicated content, I know that there's a lot of ways that people pretend like they can mask that nowadays. You see that a lot with older websites, mm -hmm. the duplicated content. And for anyone out there listening, you know, I, I will add into this that I know from personal experience that duplicated content can really start messing with your your search engine rankings. Um, and a, lo a, while, a long time ago, Google would not, they didn't penalize websites for that. Is that correct? So um, it, they still haven't definitively said whether or not they do. They've made several contradictory statements, but there's been a lot of independent tests that show that they do penalize it. And it's not hard to understand why. Um, if you have, if you and I wrote the exact same blog post about dental marketing or something, it, identical, and someone searched for the title of it, well, who are they gonna show? Well, one or the other. Somebody is gonna get penalized for duplicate content. And if you're coming to the game now, and there's already 5,000 other dental websites with the same content, you're probably not gonna be the winner here. Um, if you do get plagiarized, Google has some ways to figure out kind of who wrote the content first. Um, there's some tags you can embed to, and it, depending on when they indexed your site and found that content first, they can kind of figure out who the source was. But if you're going to a company that's giving you the same content they've been giving dentists for 10 years, and there's you know thousands of customers, you can't have high expectations that this content will rank. Um, and oftentimes we don't even see it indexed at all. Um, well, I remember doing like you know video reviews or, or on, like when I used to do sales for uh, for our clients, and you, it, you know, sometimes you'd be perplexed as to why Google was returning zero results for a page. Like, oh, they're, they're just not even ranking it. It's it's duplicate content. They already have fifty thousand records for this snippet of text. They don't need another one. So they just don't even rank it at all. So that's the the danger of having duplicate content. Occasionally, if you're in a really uncompetitive market, um, sometimes you can get away with it, but sometimes they won't even index your content. So that is probably one of the bigger red flags out there for dental websites. So if you're engaged with the company, they've sent you some references and you're checking out ones, you've done a little bit of independent research outside of what they told you to do, checking with colleagues, looking at other websites they've created, what is Away, what are some other red flags that you could see on on websites? Well, let, let me address the, the content. Like, it's very easy to check this. Um, ask the company you're working with. Can you give me an example of some of the uh, the websites that you've written content for? Because it, make sure you're being fair. Sometimes clients write their own copy, um, mm -hmm. and sometimes clients steal copy. Um, sometimes, uh, or sometimes clients just bring the copy over that they have a legal right to use, but it's duplicate, and they just say, "Well, I'll get to this later." Um, so ask the company for examples of content they wrote, and then put the pages through Copyscape. Um, you can go to copyscape.com, 
and type and enter in a URL or cut and paste it, and it'll tell you if the copy's been duplicated. Or take a snippet of the text, a sentence or two, put it in quotes, and Google it. Google will find. Uh, if Google can find it, you're, uh, um, then you know then you know this is duplicated content. Um, so you want zero results for those things when you when you test it and test a couple pages, and that should be that's a pretty good you know back of the envelope test. Um, as far as other red flags, uh, I mean there, there's a lot of technical things that you could look under the hood with that would probably bore the audience. Um, you want to make sure it looks nice on a mobile phone. That's another thing to ask for. Um, pull up the site on your mobile phone, uh, and it should be the same address as it is on your browser. That's that's important to look at. What you don't want is for the website to be forwarded to, you know, your your dentist dot or mm -hmm. you know m dot dot com. Google wants everything to be what they call responsive, um, mm -hmm. and everything to be on the same domain, and that makes maintenance a lot easier too. Um, in the past, people would set up separate mobile websites. But now you're just duplicating the amount of um, content you have to maintain. You're duplicating your maintenance costs and time. And additionally, most people just, and most people just don't do a good job. So in theory, that can work uh, if you really do duplicate your time. But uh, most people don't, and you don't have all of your content accessible to Google's mobile search engine. And I think it was like a month or two ago, Google announced that mobile search traffic had surpassed desktop search traffic. So there's now a, major, a majority of the searches are done on a mobile device. You, that's, you know, in, depending on your market, we still don't see the majority of our customers' uh, website traffic coming from mobile, but it's, it's getting there. Um, it, you want all of your content to be accessible on a mobile device. That's very important. Otherwise, you're just kind of shutting your door or giving a bad experience to, you know, 20, 30, 40% of your potential patients. Don't do that. Um, give them the same experience. Make sure the site is responsive. That's another word you should ask, and you can verify it by bringing it up in a mobile phone and making sure the URL is exactly the same and it looks good on a mobile device. If that's if if that looks good, that's probably a good like 99% uh, case test. I I usually roll my eyes whenever I, I load a website and it says mobi dot whatever, and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna have a lot of <laughs> I'm gonna have a lot of problems figuring out where I want to go on this website. They they were able to sell a lot of dot movie domain names like that uh, with fear, um, but it's it's not necessary at all. Absolutely. So kind of touching back on what you said about the uh, the fact that mobile is starting to take over um, uh, uh, desktop search. In my mind, probably what's going on, you know, if you think about who the decision makers of who spends the money, well, you know, I may research certain things. My wife usually is the one who pulls the trigger. Uh, my wife, we don't have a desktop at our house, so she uses her phone for everything, a mm -hmm. iPad or, or, or tablet or, or, or whatever. And, you know, she's got our, our kid and she's, we're having another one soon. So she is always on the move. So she doesn't have time to, crack open a laptop and start searching for something. She's just going to look at it on her, on her phone whenever she's got five minutes to sit down and figure out what she's going to do next. So. Yeah. I, um, and my wife is the same way. Um, and I, I mean, we can start to stereotype, but uh, moms seem to do that. Um, I have a desktop um, and a laptop and another laptop um, and my phone where I'm an electrical engineer, I guess, but my wife is basically, you know, iPad and phone most of the time. When she needs to do work um, for her business, she'll sit down on her laptop and, you know, do accounting reconciliation or something. But for most of the casual browsing and research and reading, she does it on her phone on that tiny screen. Um, I don't get it, but she does it constantly. And I, I hear the same things uh, said oftentimes by um, friends of mine or um, uh, moms that I know personally. Absolutely. So um, I know there's going to be a certain segment of people out there that are listening to this and are going to say, okay, I'm, you know, I am going to bootstrap this. I want to be a, a, as frugal as possible as a business owner. Um, so I'm going to try and attempt to do this by myself. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, you know, an infinite amount of information out there of how to do this kind of stuff. But if you're going to do all the things that we talked about today, which is like, you know, making sure you have consistent branding across all of your mediums, making sure that the, you know, you have a, a responsive site, making sure that it connects to, you know, call trackers or you can set up phone numbers where you can you know, have engaging copy to where you can do all of these different things. 
you're going to be spending a significant amount of time doing that on your own as far as researching how the heck to get it to start, go up. Uh, like you said, the maintenance goes. I have a little monitor on my website that sends me an inf information if it goes down. And, you know, there are certain times when it won't, it won't take itself back up because of the host that I'm using uh, will, uh, will, will have something broken on their end. I'll have to contact their support. I'll have to spend, you know, I'll have to find two hours out of my day to be able to contact their support to fix whatever problem that just, just got caused because of, you know, internet stuff. Um, that you're going to have to become familiar with in order to do that. And that is perfectly valid for some people to do. Um, so for those people, what would you say are like the core tenets of what they would need to have on their website if they just absolutely had to go that route? Yeah, I mean, you, you can do that. And there are software platforms that make it easier. Um, we have probably like 5% of our customer base are do-it-yourself tenants. Mm -hmm. And they kind of use our software as a shortcut. Um, I, I don't want to get too salesy here, but I mean, they, there are software platforms like ours out there that can make, can give you a shortcut where you just want to write the content, but you don't want to deal with security, backups, hosting, you know, DNS records, like all, all this kind of, of under the hood junk that is really not going to help you in any other ventures. Um, and, but you're going to have to learn and deal with at some point. Um, so, it, yeah, I mean, if you can find a software platform that makes it easy for you to host the site and at least take some of those things out of your hair, um, but if not, you're gonna learn. You're gonna need to learn how to host a site, how like a website control panel works, um, how to use FTP to transfer files. If you're using a content management system, maybe how to run MySQL scripts on the database. Um, you're gonna have to regularly back up uh, the site. You're going to have to update the site if you're using um, a content management system to make sure it's not open to security holes. Um, there's a lot of great free um, open source content management systems. WordPress is probably the most popular, um, but they do have frequent security holes. And you're pretty safe if you patch them as soon as announcements come out. But most people don't do that. And usually those things linger for six months. And when that happens, you're very vulnerable to just an automated computer program attacking you and there's nothing you can really do about it. And we, we have hundreds of those automated attempts a day and they just kind of bounce off and go away. But if you have a known security hole that you haven't patched, that's a little bit dangerous. It's, it's just like never updating your Windows uh, you know, operating system or your, your Mac operating system. You're, you're opening yourself up to not sophisticated hackers targeting you. That's a, that's a different story, but just automated attacks that everybody is exposed to. Um, yeah, so there's, and that's just kind of hosting the website. Um, you know, you, if when you're getting into marketing, that's a whole other kind of skill set that you'll have to learn yourself. And I think there, there are some dentists who who are very good at this. Um, they've they've kind of taken it on as a hobby, and they really love creating websites. They're very technically minded. Maybe they had a computer science or engineering background before they got into this, and they just really like to do it. If that's the case, by all means, go ahead. Um, other dentists are very into marketing, um, and they just need somebody to, you know, help them with their website, uh, the technical aspects. But they'll write all the copy, you know, they'll give you their logo. Um, maybe they'll have your your design, our graphic designer work on it, but they'll and then they'll take it from here. Um, that's fine too. Um, you know, you can always work with a company that's flexible that can serve some or all of your needs, but. Be prepared for you know the amount of time and uh, the skill set required to work on your own website. Absolutely, I think that's going to be really helpful for the people out there that are, are considering maybe I will, maybe I won't. Uh, mm -hmm. Having a list of things to start kind of familiarizing yourself with is really important. And again, we may, we may someone may be listening that's you know five years out from ownership and they've got a long time to prepare for those things, and that's an interest of theirs. I will say this: the vulnerability thing you talked about is very, very real. I speak from personal experience. I had a website a few years ago that it was just, I just left it up. I didn't have anything going on in there. It was just a, a content website that I had like written some blog post on at some point in time. And I just never updated it. And it, it, it and then a virus got into it and it affected all of my websites because I had quite a few of them. And it like, was like a worm that just went in one little hole in, in a plugin through WordPress and just 
completely infected everything on all my websites and it and I almost had to delete everything that was going on in order to be able to fix what happened. Luckily, I figured a workaround, but that's a very, very real thing that a lot of people I don't think think about enough. If that uh, happens, because we've had, I can think of a few clients we've had that were in that same situation, and the effects of that aren't just your website goes down for a while. Google can blacklist your website because mm -hmm. a lot of the purpose of these worms or viruses that get into your website is to transmit themselves to your people that view your site. That's how they spread. So Google will find this, and they know what's going on. So they will uh, they will display a message when people look for your website that says this website's been hacked. You shouldn't go there. That's not good for online marketing. And if you try to go there, in for example Google Chrome, it'll actively come up with a big red warning that says get out of here. There's a virus. It's going to take over your computer. And very few people will ignore that. Um, <laughs> but you you really don't want that. I can remember the mine. It said, uh, "This website should not be trusted." Yeah, that, so, that sounds about right. And I was like, I was just like, you know, I hope they trust it. I mean, I gotta, I gotta fix that. And then you know, they've got whenever after you fix it, you've got to hope that Google realizes that you fixed it because you know. Uh, like, it's oh, not immediate, and usually you have to. I, I can't remember what we had to do. I thought we had to submit something through Google Webmaster Tools and go through mm -hmm. kind of like a verification process, and it took weeks. Yep. And anytime you've got that mom coming in that's got her three kids and she says sees something that says this website should not be trusted. Well, I'm gonna go I'm gonna push back and I'm gonna go and look at the one that doesn't say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean they're 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 pretty much erasing you from the internet until you, you fix it. it. You're you're like a leper uh, coming into the town square. No, everybody stay away from that guy. <laughs> Well, great. So we've covered some some really good information for that person who is kind of on the fence or has taken a little bit of action to take a step forward to, to purchasing their own practice or to buy out a practice. Is there any other like parting information that you want to share that could be useful to, to that person? Um, I, I can tell you, uh, I, I just answered this thread in Dentaltown a couple of days, and maybe that's why it's on my mind. But there's a couple of things that you can do, uh, especially if you're a new practice, um, in advance of contacting um, a company like ours. Um, and that start making sure you have a portfolio before and after cases. Even if you're in dental school um, and your your work isn't quite where it's going to be in a few years, get in the habit of doing that after every procedure. Um, I believe if you do not, uh, if you're not taking personal identifiable pictures, you're just taking pictures of the mouth. Um, you don't need to have a release. Um, you ideally take one of the whole the whole face and the whole smile and get one. Um, and video testimonials, same thing. When clients come to us and they already have a library of video content and before and after cases, and they've kind of uh, written down some bullet points for each type of service they offer, like if it's teeth whitening, if you're doing, you know, you do Zoom teeth whitening, do you do core teeth whitening, do you just give people, you know, lumps of baking soda, um, you know, what do you do that's different or interesting? You know, do you have some kind of special training? Um, did you go to the Panky Institute? Um, and learn, you know, uh, some advanced dental procedures there. Um, do you have a holistic uh, philosophy of dentistry? Um, you know, anything that kind of sets you apart. If you can start, you don't have to write all the content unless you want to, but if you start sketching out the bullet points, uh, your project will go quicker and it will be more successful and success will happen sooner. When we have clients that bring us that stuff, we are always very excited about getting those projects because we know they're going to be easy. Uh, we know the client's going to be happy, and we know they're going to produce a lot of new patients for the, the practice. So having that content ready in advance, you know, if you're even thinking about creating a new website, you should be thinking about creating the content for it in advance. That's really, really good information. I think that there's, there's, there's someone out there that's listening right now. I know you're out there that is in dental school, and they're thinking about, what do I need to start doing? And I think that, that will set you so far ahead rather than having to scramble to get all of these things at the end. Uh, these are proven marketing techniques that uh, will, will really, really pay off for it. So great. That's, that's fantastic. So you've been really, really helpful. If uh, anybody wants to reach out for any reason to ask any other follow-up questions or to kind of pick your brain a little bit on, on certain areas of, of website ownership, what's a good way for them to reach you? Uh, just go to greatdentalwebsites.com um, or just Google Great Dental Websites. Um, you can probably search me by name, Jeff Gladnick, uh, G-L-A-D-N-I-C-K, exactly like it sounds. Um, I'm pretty accessible. Um, you can call the office and talk to me if you want to uh, for some reason. I'm always happy to talk to clients. 
Uh, my email is jeff at greatdentalwebsites.com, J-E-F-F, -F, um, if anybody wants to reach me. Awesome. Well, this has been fantastic. Everyone out there, I hope you've got a lot of information out of here. I hope that uh, it's, been, it's been helpful. And so we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Pleasure to, have, uh, pleasure to be here. Thanks again. Yeah, thanks. A special thanks to Jeff for coming on the show with us today. Jeff is the man when it comes to knowing what it takes to have a successful website in dentistry. And we went through a lot of information today. So Jeff has created an incredible resource that if you're in the audience and you're thinking, I would like to try to do this myself just to see what I can do, Jeff has created this resource for you for free. All you have to do to receive this amazing resource is text the word practice to 33444. That's practice to 33444. And you're also going to get every other free resource and bonus we've created in Start Your Dental Practices podcast. So if you want that free gift, you can text practice to 33444 or visit startyourdentalpractice.com slash bonus if you're outside the U.S. I highly recommend you check out this resource. It's probably my favorite bonus that we've done so far, and I'm really thankful for Jeff for creating it for us. So that's it for today's episode, but that doesn't mean that the learning and implementation have to stop there. I've created a free report called The 15 Numbers That Will Make or Break Your Dental Practice. This report has been downloaded over a thousand times by dental professionals. So if you want your free copy of this report that's going to outline what the most important numbers are in any dental practice, and it also includes how to look at your numbers, how to set goals, has a whole slew of really important information that is the culmination of all of my experience as a dental, dental CPA, then just go to startyourdentalpractice.com slash free gift. That is start your dental practice.com slash free gift. And so that's it for today, Ambitious Dentist. Again, I'm Jonathan Van Horn, CPA and ABV. I'll see you next week with another world-class practice owner or consultant that will help you start your very own dental practice. Thank you guys so much for being a part of the Start Your Dental Practice community. If you enjoyed today's episode, please do me a favor and go to startyourdentalpractice.com slash iTunes to leave your honest feedback and review on iTunes. It's going to help me create a better experience, a better show, a better podcast for you, the ambitious dentist. Your feedback really does help. Regardless if you like the show today or not, if you didn't like the show, let me know because it's going to help me create a better show and podcast for you. Lastly, if you know of anybody that would benefit from today's episode and today's content, today's guest, please feel free to share with them on social media or through email.